Okay, so I probably owe some kind of explanation for what's happening here. Um, this right here is called Stellarium, and I should load it by default how it looks. Let me give me one second. Okay, so Stellarium is a planetarium software. It's completely free. It uh, offers a lot of functionality, a lot of plugins and stuff. You can tie this into running observatories, running basically any kind of telescope, or if you're just interested in space, want to look at sky and all the different objects. Um, it's a really great planetarium app. Um, but by default, the horizon around you is tied to just basically like textbook. Okay, we'll throw some trees, we'll throw some buildings. It doesn't really represent the area around you. Uh, so there's a lot of customizability that you have. So you can take the location where it is and ignore, like, so this building here obviously doesn't exist where I am. But if you zoom out, the sky is really how you're trying to tie things in. So in the location standpoint, you can go through and pick locations all around the world. And you can do it either uh, latitude and longitude, you can select locations that exist in the database here of like high population centers people usually live. Um, you can pinpoint by clicking on the map. Um, but really, you're going to get the most out of it if you enter your latitude and longitude. Um, so I've already done that for where I happen to exist. And uh, that's where you run north, south, east, west. And you basically, on those coordinates, you select where you exist. Um, you can input your elevation, which really doesn't that make it doesn't make that much of a difference for how the software applies the star map to where you are, but it's just another level of getting as accurate as you can for where you are. Um, but I don't usually use any of this. I stick to where I've already pre-programmed it for where I currently am, and that's uh, plus 38 degrees and negative 104 degrees. Um, so that means I'm on the northern hemisphere and I'm generally westward of the meridian. So how are some other ways you can customize this? So what I've done the last couple of days is I've looked at, oh, this actually doesn't apply to me in terms of the horizon. So knowing that you have stars that rise and set on the east and west, you have different obstructions that block where you want to look at stars. So I've gone through and I've inputted my personal data. So what does that look like? Um, I went through. I took day and night shots. So let me go ahead and change the time to during the day. And I'll talk through all this functionality in the software here in a little bit. Okay, so during the day. Uh, this is my backyard, and this is what I can see on the horizon. So I'm lucky where I live now that I really don't have that many obstructions beyond just on the horizon. So what I did the last few days is I took some daytime photographs, some daytime panoramics um, of 360 degrees of my backyard. So during the day when the sun was, uh, I want to say it was just before noon. So that's why the shadows aren't, qu aren't quite just up and down, but pretty close. I went through and I did a panoramic shot. So I took my camera and I set it up where I know I'm going to set my scope up <laughs> at this point on the ground. <laughs> And I did a full 360 degree panoramic shot. And what that does is show basically all the way around what my sky should look like during the day. And what during the day shows is beyond just having like a color image of the buildings around me um, and my terrain, what it really shows is where the boundaries are across the horizon. So if I have a scope set up in my backyard and I want, I want to watch stars, they're going to rise and they're going to set at different points within the backyard. So I need to know, hey, is this particular um, shed right here going to cause a problem for when things rise? And here towards the west, do these different trees pose an obstacle when objects are setting? So the higher that you have an object, whether it's a tree or a building, either on the east or the west side, they're going to shorten the amount of time that you can image something. So what I want to know before I even drag all my stuff out here and get it all set up is at what point am I going to have problems with something getting in the way of when I want to image something. So that's the first step of what I wanted to solve. Uh, and that first step is really solved by doing the 360 panorama during the day. What physical obstacles do I have 
that block my view. So I did all that. I went through and set it up. Uh, and that was step one. Uh, step two is going through and looking at, OK, so that's cool. During the day, I have physical obstacles in the way. During the night, it's a little bit more complicated. So it's not just as simple as, is there something in the way? It's a little bit more complicated in terms of what light is going to get in the way. Uh, and what I mean by that will become much more apparent here when I fast forward. So let me go ahead and select the time scale here. And I'll skip forward a few hours. So at night, um, let me zoom in here. So this is a little bit more realistic. Um, so as I pan around here at night, which this is at about 7 p.m. local time to where I am in Colorado Springs, uh, the buildings are still the same problem as they were during the day. So a building is going to block the light during the day, just like it'll block it at night. So when I go through and do a 360 panorama at night, what I'm trying to gather is the light data. And that comes into play for a multitude of reasons. So the first and foremost thing you're going to notice is, so let's take this neighbor here to the south. He has a very bright porch light um, that is not ideal for a backyard uh, observatory standpoint. And it's going to cause some problems, but it's not the end of the world. Um, it really has a small localized area of influence and you can block that. So if, if I really was concerned about this particular light, I can go through and set something up a little bit further out uh, to the south in my yard and just block that light like a just build a simple wall there and that'll block that light and it really won't be a problem. Um, so near term lights are the first aspect of what's being captured here from the night panorama. So you can see I have the yard we've talked about to the south. Um, some simple yard light to the west. Um, obviously, I wouldn't have my own house lights on if I'm trying to do an imaging session, um, but I thought it showed some cool depth here. Um, now, to the east, I do have some interim problems. So I have all of these lights, the street light here that's directly to the east, a bunch of uh, porch lights that are on almost every single night. So yes, this is just a representation of one night, um, but I've been here for a while and I can say this is pretty accurate. There is a porch light here actually that turns on um, based on motion. So when they let their two dogs out and they run around in the yard, there's a very bright light that turns on here. Um, it's it's not on for the whole night. It's uh, motion based, so it turns off after time. Um, but generally speaking, near light, I do have a lot of problems over here to the east. Um, like I said, there's a street light. There are a lot of porch lights and garage lights here that we see. And something I wasn't anticipating is that this garage door here on the shed is actually really, like, really reflective. So depending on how many lights are on over here, I do have a lot of nearby light that turns on. Um, not necessarily directly, but indirectly, it reflects a lot of light. Uh, to the southeast, we have a lot of lights here, um, and we already talked about to the south. Okay, so if I want to take my night imaging to the next level, or at least looking beyond the uh, light capture that I did for the panorama in Stellarium, the next part of that is the sky glow. So I am pretty close to a lot of proximity, or uh, to a lot of population centers in the area. To the southwest, we have the general Colorado Springs area. So if you look over here, all of this sky glow right here, which uh, takes up pretty low on the horizon, but still pretty significant, um, all of this is Colorado Springs. So the main population center is really where a lot of this light's coming from. Um, so when you're talking astronomy, you're you're really looking at east and west as being where you want to focus your attention. So to the west. Obviously, I have a lot of light pollution. Um, the other unfortunate position of where we are uh, to the east is it's a small population center. There aren't that many people, but it's really like where we're localized. So our address is Peyton, but we actually fall within uh, Falcon being our county and or city. And Falcon is right here. So this is very close. It's not a very large population center. So Colorado Springs is huge, but it's further away. Um, Falcon is small, but it's very close. So you can see that it really has the same amount of light pollution being tossed in the sky. Um, I haven't really had a lot of experience yet to see which one's going to play more of a role in terms of what we can capture 
image wise, but uh, I was I was interested <laughs> and intrigued to see that Colorado Springs, further away, very bright, looks very similar to Falcon, which is closer and overall not as bright per se. So the way celestial bodies go, they run from east. Uh, towards the west, so I got to plan my stuff accordingly. So after importing the daylight and nightlight data, I now have a very good tool with which I can plan how I want to image things. Um, the other part of that is there's an intrinsic amount of light pollution that exists uh, within your sky. So uh, it's the difference of living in a city and living in rural America or rural anywhere where you don't have as many lights. So Stellarium also accounts for that. And something you can do is describe the intrinsic light pollution that you have of where you exist. So uh, the Bortle classification um, is really kind of a subjective thing, but it is rooted in math in some way. Um, basically, there's one through nine that dictate skies. So Bortle 1 is going to be the lowest, Bortle 9 is going to be the highest. Um, there are a few online resources you can use that help you find this. There's some tools that you can physically have with you where you measure the luminance in the sky um, uh, per the radius of the area that you're looking at. Um, I don't have tools to measure that, so I go off of the online resource. And you can input that information and it'll show you basically surveys that have been uh, carried out within the area in which you live and it'll tell you what the light pollution is like. So from being in Missouri where I had a Bortle 4 and now where I live is a Bortle 5, they're pretty comparable. I'm on the low end of 5 where I am now and I was the high end of 4 where I lived before. So it really varies. Um, and again I said this is kind of subjective because there are other things to get in the way. So Something I'm running into here in the Colorado Springs area is that, yes, I have less atmosphere because we're at a high altitude, so there's less air between where I am on the ground to uh, like the diminishing returns of atmosphere to what I can image. But I do have a lot of wind here. So we're in the mountainous area, and that just means that there's a high discrepancy between uh, thermals high and low, and that's going to mean a lot of air displacing and moving from one side to the other. So I have experienced a lot of wind here. Um, that's not something I really had to deal with in Missouri. I had arguably darker skies with less wind, which was ideal. So something I'm having to adjust with here is I have skies that might be uh, less transparent or more transparent because there's less sky in the way. Um, but I'm dealing with more of a seeing issue, which is wind either pushing your scope around or causing turbulence in the atmosphere above where you're looking. And that basically boils down to if you have turbulent wind, it's something akin to looking through a body of water at the rocks. So if you look at it like a, a shallow lake or a shallow river or something, you have the water shimmering and uh, you have the rock down below that, the rock's going to look like it's shimmering because you're looking through the water. It's the same way with the atmosphere. It's all fluid dynamics, so if the air is moving, it's the same as looking through water moving. It's just it's just amplified at different levels. Um, so that's the problem that I have here in Colorado. Um, but overall, I'm really excited about getting this set up to where I can plan out my days. So I I haven't fully been to my unit yet. I don't know what free time I'm going to have. So either way, it's important to know. So let me show you one of the reasons why this is important. So let's take Saturn, for instance. So let's say I want to image Saturn. I need to know exactly when it rises and when it sets, not just on the horizon, because the horizon is going to be a flat plane that we're looking at in terms of where things will uh, theoretically cross that threshold. But we have other objects that are in the way, which is why I wanted to set this up to begin with. So if I go through and I plot my backyard, and if I wanted to have a permanent observatory in this location, for instance, which is probably going to be happening in the near future, I want to know when I can or cannot see something. Um, because basically, why would you set something up 
in terms of imaging and going through all the motions of getting everything set up if you can't see it for the set amount of time that you want. So if you look at things by the minute, I'm shifting by one minute, and you can see how much Saturn is moving each minute. It's kind of astounding here. So at some point here, Saturn reaches that point where I can't see it. So that's something I should probably know if I want to plan from the time that it rises in the east and the time it's going to set on the west. I should know all of that information. Um, and inputting my data in terms of what my horizon looks like is something that I can use uh, to capture that. So with planets, the only thing you have to worry about really is when you have objects that physically block it. But this becomes even more complicated when you're talking about something that's very dim. Um, so let me turn on galaxies here. So galaxies are extremely dim. Saturn's bright. The only thing that matters is that it crosses something that physically blocks your field of view. If you're talking galaxies or uh, any deep sky object, really, really far away, really dim. And that's where the light pollution map really comes into play. So there's a point where you see, let me look at the data here that we have on the left. Any object I click on, and I can zoom into, so I can look beyond uh, just what I could see if I was in my backyard. I don't think I've expressed that yet. But uh, so these deep sky objects, I can click on one and it shows the magnitude. So this magnitude is the magnitude of the object. It doesn't account for uh, what it looks like when you look at, for instance, me being in a Bortle 5, which is right in the middle of the spectrum of light pollution. The ambient brightness of the sky will impact what you can see in the distance. So if you have a dim object in the distance, then it'll be overpowered at some point by the brightness of the ambient sky around you. And this is the definition of how light pollution affects things. I mean, if you're in the middle of New York City, the sky looks so bright, you're not going to see a single star. You just see like the glow of all the street lights, of all the city lights. Everything around you is going to cause this glow in the atmosphere, and you're just not going to see anything. So the happy medium is where I am, and I can show you that. Uh, so let me zoom out here. This is the sky as it's simulated for the Bortle class light pollution in my area. It's not perfect, but it's pretty accurate. So like when it shows a star um, that should be visible, uh, especially, let me back up a little bit. So if you're in that weird transition point between uh, day and night, most of the time, the first things you'll see are gonna be planets. So that's what you see here. So I'm at uh, 5, 10 p.m. in the middle of November. Uh, you don't see a lot here. And I know this is a simulation that's not exactly perfectly accurate, but it's it's honestly pretty close to what you see on a day-to-day -day basis. So here towards the west, we see the sun setting behind the Rockies. And you see the sky glow from that sun still illuminating the atmosphere. And the first bodies that you see, like you scroll around all through here, yeah, the moon. We've all seen the moon during the day. It's, it's pretty bright, it's pretty close. Um, but the first things you'll really see are planets. And it just so happens that today, the, the 9th uh, of November, you see in sequence from the sun just behind the Rockies, you see Venus, which makes sense. It's pretty close to the sun. You see Jupiter, you see Saturn, uh, and they're diminishing in brightness as you go. And I know here you can actually see the names of the planets, but the luminosity of these planets are very noticeable. And I did this test yesterday where I looked at basically the same time of day. It said you should be able to see Venus, you should be able to see Jupiter, you should be able to see Saturn. Um, I want to say there was a bright star here that you should see, and here's the moon. So lo and behold, I walked out of my backyard. I stood at the same spot, um, and I could see all the planets I could see the moon. I couldn't quite see the star here. I mean, it was this one right here. I'm gonna let me click on it. Yep, there we go. Fomalhaut. That was the star that I should have been able to see per the uh, software here. I couldn't see it. Uh, doesn't mean it wasn't there, because obviously it was. I just couldn't see it. 
but it did accurately reflect what I could see here planet-wise. Um, so let me fast forward here to what I was talking about. Um, so light pollution, let me break that down. So if I go through here, I have an option where I can select light pollution. I've already pre-selected uh, Bortle 5, which is the light pollution of the area in which I currently reside. Now let me set this down. So I've been to some dark sky sites and it's pretty ridiculous how many more stars you can see if you're in a state park, a national park, somewhere where you don't have a lot of light pollution sources uh, within the vicinity of where you are. And you can't do it just here in the software that I'm talking about, but it really does make a huge difference. Um, so I'll try to simulate that by showing you, let me move this out of the way a bit. Okay, so here's uh, Bortle 1. Basically, best case scenario, you don't have any city lights, you don't have anything around you. Um, you basically see a lot more stars. Constellations become very difficult to pick out, so the known constellations that we have, like Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, um, the general thing, the very simple things that we have to identify the sky are they're still there, obviously, but they're really hard to sort out because you have so many other stars around the main powerhouses that form that constellation. It becomes very difficult, and you can kind of see that here. So, um, best case scenario, if my house was in a Bortle One, <laughs> like national park type location, you would see all these stars. Obviously, you wouldn't have the uh, names and everything tying to it. Um, but that reminds me that that points out that. This software also goes off of other light factors that are in the way. So we've already programmed in the sky glow that gets in the way and dims some of the stars you might see, and some nearby light pollution that gets in the way. Uh, but things like the moon. The moon is beautiful, and it's a fantastic subject that you can look at with a telescope or a small uh, lens for a camera, and you can get some fantastic detail. It's great. But it's also basically a giant mirror in the sky that just reflects sunlight. And uh, if you think of the fact that you can't do like astrophotography during the day because the sun is lighting up the atmosphere, well, the moon is just reflecting all of that sunlight back at the Earth even during the night. So the moon turns into basically public enemy number two, the first being the sun, the second being the moon, um, for just getting in the way. And it's, it's unfortunate but it's a thing. So um, another reason why I would like to have Stellarium set up to help me with my planning is looking at, okay, when is one, the sun gone? And when do we have a new moon where the, the moon is not around to reflect a lot of light in the way? And Stellarium does a really good job of notifying you, or not notifying you, but uh, simulating how that light impacts your possible night viewing session. So if I zoom out and I look away from the moon, I have a lot of stars, and as I move towards the moon, you should be able to see how it simulates how much the moon gets in the way. Up oh, there we go, stars disappear. So looking away, these four stars, for instance, are visible. Let me bring the moon into play. They get dimmer. You can't really see them as much. So the moon plays a role in terms of what you can see. So that's another aspect of how Stellarium will help with the planning process. I can say, hey, what I want to image happens to be close to the moon, I'm probably not going to get a lot of data. Or, hey, it's unfortunate that I have a clear night and the moon is up. Maybe I want to look at something that's opposite the moon. So the moon is behind me and won't necessarily cast as much ambient light across the sky. So that's another way that Stellarium becomes very useful. So talking more about light pollution, because light pollution is seriously public enemy number one, just any ambient light gets in the way and you can't collect the data of stars that are <laughs> really far away and every photon counts, well, every photon can be negated by a nearby photon light source that's just throwing noise in the way and blocking what you're trying to do. Um, so let me try to show. That was best case scenario, Bortle 1, uh, there's no nearby light pollution, which is contrary to what you see around me here. Um, 
not just nearby with a, like neighbor lights, but also with the ambient light pollution. You wouldn't see any of this stuff in a Bortle Class 1 sky. So uh, my last place that I lived in Missouri was Bortle 4. So let me step back here. You can already see, uh, just picking a random place in the sky, I looked at the northeast, so the moon's up uh, to our top right. This is Bortle 1. This is no light pollution. Now let me add the next one, Portal 2. You can already see how many objects disappear. Not just the named objects, but also just the ambient objects around you. You can see that difference. So, um, Portal 1, Portal 2. Um, so every step of classification Portal-wise that you raise, you're just losing the potential objects. So Portal 2. Let's see Bortle 3. You lose even more. You can see even <laughs> like the named objects go away. So Bortle 1, this right here kind of generally represents the Milky Way, which is why you have so many objects along that. Um, those of you that don't know, the Milky Way is our own galaxy. We exist within its plane, and it generally runs planar across the night sky. Depending on the time of year, it, it ships. But basically, a lot of well, all of the uh, galactic objects reside within that plane, which is why there's that disk. The Milky Way is our own galaxy. We exist in that disk, and you have it scattered across the sky in a generally planar looking motion. And that's what you see right here. So if you trace these high density objects, you see it runs from the northeast right now, at least this time of year, all the way across to the west and it just is a disk across the top of the sky you're not going to see that unless you're in very dark areas as you'll see most of these objects will disappear as i raise the border class so we're at border class one two there are even fewer border class three <laughs> far fewer not just in the milky way but across the sky Bortle 4, so this represents where I was in Missouri. Now you could, if all your neighbors turn the lights off, which I did have good neighbors in Missouri that would mostly turn their lights off if they saw me setting my stuff up, um, you could see the Milky Way. Just barely. It wasn't very obvious, but it was there. Um, and then Bortle 5. So this is where I am currently. And I gotta say, this is actually pretty accurate to what I've seen when I walk out to my backyard and look at how many stars I can see. I can generally, of course, always see the moon because it's uh, super bright. I can identify the North Star, which I've localized as generally directly above my back door. And that's accurate for how I've simulated it here versus what I see in real life. Um, but yeah, you can see there are so many like fewer stars that you can actually pick out. And this is representative of what you can actually see. So let me show Bortle 1, a lot of stars. Bortle 5, not so much. But I'm I'm right in the middle of that Bortle classification system of light pollution. And uh, I've, I've joined a lot of astrophotography groups, and a lot of people are working at Bortle 7, 8, 9. Let me show you what that would look like. So Bortle 9 is like worst case scenario. You're in the middle of Seattle. You're in the middle of New York. Um, basically, you don't see stars. So let me put that up to Bortle 9. I mean, you have a handful of stars that you can pick out. Obviously, the moon's always going to be visible because it's bright as hell. Um, you'll see planets. But Bortle 9, that's that's gross. I mean, you don't see anything. Um, but ultimately, that's something that Stellarium offers you, is you have the ability to customize not just your horizon, which I've done here for day and night, um, but you also have the ability to pick, oh, that's something I haven't talked about, but you have the ability to pick where you are in the world. So I've already gone through and calibrated where I am. Hold on one second. Okay, there we go. So I talked about this before, calibrated where I am. You pick your time zone or the time that you want to view. So like right now, it's not uh, 822 on the 9th, it's actually, that's actually, 1118 on the 9th, 
So you can pick the time. You can go through and again, set up your horizon. You can go through and set up your border classification. And all of this comes into play for when you wanna plan things out. So you, you can't necessarily always know when you're gonna have clear nights, but what you can know mathematically is where bodies are gonna raise and set. So how does this apply to something in the near future? So the 11th, uh, I have a live stream event set up for the Mercury transit in front of the sun. So what would that possibly look like? So I can go through, I can bring up the date and time. I can say, I wanna to go to November 11th. I wanna pick the timeline. So I happen to know that the eclipse is starting around dawn, um, actually for where I am a little bit before dawn. And I can see that the sun, based on where I place my telescope on this point of ground, which is the best location in my backyard, I can't see the sun here, and I wouldn't necessarily have known that. Uh, all data shows within the Colorado Springs area that the sun is gonna rise at 6.30. Well, here we go, it's 6.23, and I can't see the sun. Let me forward by minute by minute. So 6.30. The sun has risen, but I can't see it. So now I can progress minute by minute. At what point am I actually gonna see the sun? There we go, the sun is fully exposed, it's 718. So uh, prior to having Stellarium set up, I already gone through and done a rough analysis and said, hey, around seven o'clock, I'm gonna stop my live stream event. Well, at seven o'clock, let me go to seven on the dot. I can't see the sun. Um, so that was kind of jumping the gun and not really doing the math and analyzing exactly when it can be seen but using this planetarium software, now I know beyond a shadow of a doubt by the minute what time the sun is gonna show. So basically 15 past the hour is the earliest possible point that I could show the sun with Mercury transiting. So what would that look like? Another powerful aspect of this software is going through and programming your camera, your telescope focal length, your orientation for your telescope, what kind of mount you use, all of that can be inputted in this software. And it's, again, a planning tool for how you can get things lined up. So let me go ahead and turn this off for a second. So if I wanna focus on an object, for instance, click on the sun, go ahead and hit spacebar so it centers it. And now basically, theoretically, I have a telescope in this location looking at the sun. What does it look like beyond that? So I can go into the view. Um, basically, this is a tool that's used to show what you can see with your given telescope setup, with the given camera setup, uh, or also if you're using eyepieces, what would it look like through the eyepiece because it changes the magnification level. And I've used this to determine how I want to look at things. So within the software, you have the ability to, as I was talking before, change your eyepieces in terms of uh, the millimeter focal length of those eyepieces, different lenses, which are helper lenses, whether you're using uh, visual or using added lens lenses to help you with astrophotography. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more specific, but sensor size, this is what's really important. So the given size of your sensor, it's very equatable to the size of your monitor, or at least the resolution of your monitor. So your computer monitor has X number of pixels uh, laterally on the X axis, and I guess Y number of pixels uh, up and down for the top side to make that 2D image. A camera sensor works the same way. You have pixels for a monitor, and you have pixels that are receiving light to map that onto a 2D surface. So the size of those pixels has something to do. So if you have larger pixels, everything's gonna be expanded if you have the same resolution. But basically just think of it as there's a surface area upon which your telescope is focusing light, at, at which case you can uh, observe that light and map it to a 2D plane. And that's what causes the images that you can look at to be displayed on a 2D plane, which is your monitor. Um, but basically you can input all the data for your camera 
pixel size, um, the x-axis, y-axis size, you input all of that information into the software and it'll allow you to determine. And it's it varies based on camera to camera. So I have two main cameras that I use for imaging. My uh, ASI 294 here is the one that I use most often. It's my main imaging cam. It's cool. It has a lot of options. It has a larger sensor size. So it actually takes advantage of the field of view of most of my scopes. Um, but sometimes you don't want to use that. Sometimes you want to use a camera like my 178 that has smaller pixels. So when you're looking at very small objects in the sky, like planets, they're very bright, they're nearby, but they take up a really small amount of space. You want to have as many pixels spread as possible in that small area. So if Jupiter is only so big, you want to have as many pixels, which means smaller sensor size, spread across that diameter so you're getting as much detail as possible. Um, semantics, not that important. Just know cameras have different pixel sizes, and that comes into play. The other thing that this software lets you input is the, foc the effective focal length of your telescope. So what I have here is I've gone through and I've basically programmed the data for all the main scopes that I use, um, or ones that I plan to have in the near future, like this 11 inch. So my main scope, the big black one that I have is an eight inch Newtonian, has a thousand uh, millimeter focal length. I've inputted that data here. So eight inches roughly correlates to 203 millimeters as a diameter, which is, as it says here, diameter. Uh, the focal length is basically the point at which you have the main objective to the point that you're observing. That's the focal length, and that's the point that's really the ratio of which the optics in your scope are focusing the light. So how long does it take for light to hit the main objective and get bent and then focus to a point which is where you want to look at things or where you have your eyepiece or where you have your camera. Basically, you're collecting light, you're focusing it to a small area, and that's how things get magnified or blown up. So I have all my main scopes programmed in here with the different focal lengths, different names. Uh, so between having your camera sensor size established for what you want to use and having your telescope's uh, admin data in terms of focal length and diameter programmed in, the software does the rest for you. So if I have my main imaging camera, which is the ASI 294, it has that set size of how far the X and Y axis work and how big those pixels work multiplied by the telescope that I want to use. So if I use my big Newtonian with the 1000 millimeter focal length and the eight inch diameter, the C8N, with the sensor here, with no modifying lenses, then this is the field of view that I have. So if I put the camera in to my scope, the sun takes up this amount of space in the sky, and this is how big the top and bottom limits and the left and right limits are. And all of that's very important for planning processes. So there's there's more to that, but I'll explain that in a little bit when I'm talking about more specific things. So the sun is a circle. Really doesn't matter how I orient my camera as long as the sun fits. So clearly here you can see that the sun fits within the field of view. But I have different scopes and I have different cameras. So what would happen if I used a smaller frame camera? So my ASI 178, for instance, has a lower resolution, it has a smaller sensor size, so it doesn't see as much of what my scope can actually look at. So this is as much of the sun. You can see that I wouldn't actually see the entire sun within the field of view of my camera. It would more or less cover most of it, but not all of it. Uh, so let me go back to my main imaging cam. It all fits within the field of view of the scope. But let's say I change the scope. So here's one of my other scopes that has twice the focal length. Um, you can see again that you don't quite see the entire sun. You do see the full diameter, but you're missing out on the North Pole and the South Pole of the sun. So this is actually the field of view that I've chosen to use for the Mercury transit. And I'll show you why. Let me zoom in a little bit. So if you go hour by hour, well, okay, so you can't see it there. So 
if we go back to when I can first see the sun, there we go. There's that shed coming in. You can see I can't see it. So again, 7.15 a.m. is the earliest point at which I can see, which that's something I wouldn't know if I couldn't use the software. The software shows me that, yo, bro, you're not going to see the sun before 7.13, at least not all of it. So if I go one more minute past, you can see it's moved. So 7.14 on November 11th is the absolute earliest that I'm going to capture the entire frame of the sun, or at least the vicinity within my sensor frame. Um, that's important here because you can already see right here, that's Mercury. Um, so through all this process, all the pictures I post, the field of view with my 294 MC, with my Mead telescope, my eight inch uh, SCT telescope, with this field of view, that's what it's gonna look like. So you have to use some imagination because there's no way in this software that you can look just to the field of view to see exactly like, I won't see anything else. So we can already see towards the uh, top here, there's some part of the sun that I can see here in the software that I wouldn't see in the frame of the image and likewise to the south. So, excuse me, there's some imagination you have to apply here, but it's still solving a lot of problems for you. So 7.15 a.m., there's Mercury. I've already missed probably a quarter of the transit, which I knew was going to happen based on the mathematics of where I lived. But I still have three quarters of the Mercury transit to go. So what does that look like? I'll progress by an hour. You can see Mercury right here in the first quarter of the transit. Me at an hour. We're almost halfway. Uh, and you can see this, the sun is brighter. So the software not only simulates the trajectories and the geometry of where things are in the sky and also simulates the atmospheric effects beyond just being night because now we're during the day um, but you still are subject to a lot of the issues that arise from atmospheric disturbance so if an object like the sun or the moon are nearby the horizon you're looking through more atmosphere because you're not looking straight up where there's less air in the way you're looking all the way across that same amount of air straight up multiplied by the distance at which you are viewing that object. So when the sun, planets, moon are near the horizon, you're looking through a lot of air, a lot more atmospheric disturbance, and a lot more atmospheric magnification. So that's why if you look at the moon or the sun when it's very close to the horizon, sometimes they just look huge. They aren't any closer, same distance as always, but you're looking through more air, it's like a giant magnifying glass, and it multiplies that size. So there's a very real chance that the sun will look lower. Now, something I haven't experimented with is you can input the atmospheric density into the software and it'll account for that based on where you're looking. So I kind of think that we're gonna see that difference here in terms of the sun looking larger, like it maxes out the left and right limits of my camera frame because it's very low on the horizon. I think once it gains altitude in the sky, it'll probably shrink a little bit. Not because the moon's or the moon or sun are actually changing sizes, but you have less air magnifying it, like from a glasses or magnifying glass standpoint. Um, so we'll see that. But one thing you can see from the last hour to this hour is the color distortion. And that color distortion is again because of how much atmosphere you're looking through. Basically it all warps things. Um, it's the same premise of why sunsets look so fantastic because you have the sun very low on the horizon looking through a lot of air all of that distorts the color distort uh, the color uh dispersion of the light leaving the sun and how it interacts with the atmosphere and that's why sun rises and sunsets are what people talk about no one goes on a romantic counting moon to look at the sun at <laughs> dead noon in the sky because it's the most boring way to look at the sun since it's the least amount of air. Um, but that's something the software simulates. So we're looking at 718 AM, very low in the sky, very dark color, lots of yellow. Skip forward an hour. Sun's lost a lot of that um, yellow dispersions turn much more white. Let's see what happens if I do another hour. Getting lighter and lighter. Um, 
But here's the field of view. So you can see Mercury transiting. Earliest standpoint, my very earliest images, best case scenario, are going to be about 7.18 in the morning. And Mercury is going to be right here. Fast forward an hour. It's going to be almost center. Still crossing through here. So what's interesting is you can see the field of view of my camera rotating. Um, if I look at the 719 versus the 819, it's rotated uh, clockwise generally. And that's one of the, it seems like it's annoying in, in the way, but it's actually much more beneficial. Uh, my type of mount that I use is aligned to celestial north, north pole, which is basically to counteract how the earth rotates in a 24 hour period. So that's very important when you're tracking celestial objects that aren't moving um, in relation to where you are in terms of the Earth rotating. So complicated, basically the equatorial mount counteracts the rotation of the Earth and you're viewing things on the same plane as the Earth rotates. Uh, and that's what's being demonstrated here. So you can see 7.30, you have such an angle you go 8.30, less of an angle. You forward an hour, you have less of an angle. Um, but you can see that the sun is generally rotating. So if you look at this hypothetical sunspot, probably not going to be any sunspots on the day of the transit because we're at solar minimum. Um, the cycle at which the sun has very little solar activity, very few sunspots, very few solar flares, not a lot going on. But as a frame of reference of what software uses here, let's look at the southern sunspot. Go back two hours so you can see sunspot is right here tracing the southern edge of the sensor path let me add an hour still right there on that sensor path Add another hour it's hugging right to it and that's the point that's that's where i'm trying to say that the equatorial mount will counteract the rotation of the earth and basically align with everything else in our solar system in terms of what that ecleptic plane is uh, across the solar system. So that sunspot, that hypothetical sunspot, is going to hug that southern edge of the frame of reference because I have an equatorial mount. Um, and that wouldn't be the case if you have an alt as mount. So let me forward again. You can already see Mercury here is making its <laughs> pass towards the west. Excuse me. By 10.30, AM, you can see it's almost done. So at this point, we're beyond uh, three quarters of the pass of Mercury. And by 1130, it's completely gone. So where does that exact point exist where Mercury leaves the transit? Right there. So we're looking at just after 11 AM. Now that's something I could go through and do a lot of math to determine. But this software, after inputting some simple information in terms of where I am on the planet coordinate wise, um, the time and the time zone in which I exist. I added some extra things like what does my horizon look like? What my house is in the way, uh, neighbor houses, neighbor shelters, what kind of light pollution do I have? Uh, and that's to include not just porch lights, but house lights, windows, um, uh, as well as the intrinsic light pollution from nearby population centers. So I have Colorado Springs, uh, over to the west, I have Falcon, Colorado, which is over to the east, and they all present some kind of sky glow, so all that information was inputted. There's some other intrinsic light pollution, which is just the general ambient light within the area, which is my Bortle 5 class that I looked online and found what that light pollution looks like and uh, how much that impacts me, and put that into the software, and it shows the overall light. Uh, I can input my telescope focal length, I can input what type of mount I have, whether it's a German equatorial mount or uh, an alt azimuth mount. I can input my camera sensor size, which plays a role with the telescope in terms of the focal length to form this field of view of what can I see. All of that is super important from a planning standpoint. So we only have so many limited clear nights where you don't have clouds in the way. Uh, why not figure out when you do have those clear nights, what other aspects are going to get in the way? Um, 
So orientation of the camera, probably the last thing I'll talk about here on Stellarium before I call it quits. Uh, so we've talked about simple things like looking at planets and the sun and the moon. Those are very bright objects and the orientation doesn't matter because you're looking at the sun, it's a circle, sphere, it's a ablate, spheroid, whatever. Um, you can rotate that field of view and it's gonna look generally the same. Doesn't really make a difference. What does matter is when you're looking at deep sky objects that are not just circles or disks that you see in the sky, but have structure and general orientations that align to what you wanna look at. Um, so let me go ahead and fast forward. Let me turn off that. Let me fast forward to when it's night. Um, get nice and dark. Okay. Let me, let me fast forward here to something that I've imaged before. Okay. So, okay, so you, you don't have to just like look through the sky in the software either. Um, you can search for things. So I'm looking for M42, uh, which is Messier 42. It's just the catalog designation for the Orion Nebula. Go ahead and find that. And let me zoom in on that. So in case you're not totally familiar, you can bring up constellation signs here. So let me add a little bit more. Um, the Orion constellation, just as any constellation, is a collection of stars that throughout history, our ancestors, for cultural reasons, historical reasons, whatever, have identified different shapes that align with stars in the sky. It's used for navigation, blah, 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 lots of different reasons. Uh, in today's world, it's a lot less about navigation, a lot more about just finding different locations in the sky to look at. The Orion constellation, you can see uh, Betelgeuse here, Bellatrix, three stars across the waist of Orion. You have Rigel, and uh, I actually don't know what this one's called. Uh, safe. Another cool thing about the software, you can click on almost anything and it gives you a lot of data here on the top left. Lots of impertinent data for the most part. You can turn off in the settings if you want, in terms of right, act, uh, right, uh, right ascension, declination, all this information here, transit time, all of that data is here. It's important depending on what you're using, but it's all there. So you have constellations that can be drawn out or you can turn it off if you want. So let's say I want to image Orion Nebula, Great Orion Nebula, center on it. Go ahead and center the software and zoom in. So this is an object I've imaged before. It's a uh, very bright, it's a great, object to image, but what I want to talk about is orientation of the camera. So let me turn back on the settings here, and let's say I want to use my 8-inch Newtonian with my ASI-294 with that set sensor size. This is generally the field of view I would see. So let's say I wanted to take a picture of the Orion Nebula, but I also wanted to get some of the Running Man Nebula. It's all orientation, so you can see that uh, left, right, top, bottom, this is what I would see if the camera was set at a zero degree offset from how the telescope is established. Now from there, the software also allows you to rotate one way or the other in degree increments. So obviously fitting the Orion Nebula and fitting the Running Man Nebula, it's just not gonna work here in this orientation. So let me go ahead and add some orientation, which is basically me rotating the camera relative to the telescope in order to rotate that field of view. So the telescope is still going to look at the same location, but if I rotate that camera, it's going to change the field of view left and right limits of what that sensor can see. So very quickly, by rotating 90 degrees from being dead center and straight lined up with the telescope, I rotate it 90 degrees. This is what I can see. So still not fitting the Running Man Nebula, but I can see all of Orion and I get about half of the Running Man Nebula. So at this point, I know that all I need to do is move my telescope and with my sensor and my telescope, I can now see the Running Man Nebula. I'll probably frame it a little bit differently. Uh, the Running Man Nebula here on the left, 
and on the right side excuse me I can see the majority of the Orion Nebula um, and this is really important from a planning process so I don't have a clear night I can't do anything I can go through and still plan what I need to do I know that I have to have my ASI 294 camera I know that I need to have my 8 inch Newtonian telescope I know that I need to rotate the camera 90 degrees against that scope in order to fit this field of view and if I have everything else set up then when I tell the computer to move my telescope to this location then this is what I'm going to see it's going to look generally how you see in this field of view I should see on the left the running man nebula and on the right I should see the Orion nebula and of course it's not exact there are a lot of other variables that get in the way your polar alignment um, you don't have things established correctly maybe things are not balanced on your mount so there's some discrepancies in terms of how it slews versus what you see but this is an absolutely fantastic planning tool especially when you have so many days that you don't have clear nights um, you can still accomplish things you can build a catalog of of this information you can take an excel spreadsheet and say hey m42 um, this camera orientation this specific camera this telescope here's the data i need to plug in and you input that data into the computer when you have everything aligned and you get generally close it's usually not perfect sometimes you'll slew and your telescope's like over here well you just got to move a little bit and you still have that framing that you um, so basically all of that information is what I wanted to cover of why it was important to me to get my data inputted my horizon inputted all this information because it's gonna save me time in the long run and it was something I haven't done before and it was kind of fun frustrating also but fun getting everything set up because I mean it's pretty impressive that I can see how things are going to look and what I can or cannot see in a given basis just based on inputting pictures, some numerical GPS data, some numerical light pollution data. And now I get a very accurate representation of what's possible, even when I don't have a clear night. So I can maximize, hey, tonight's clear. This, this, and this are possible. Let's go. Uh, super nerdy. But I think that tool, free tools like this, which I don't know if I've said, this is, a very, this is a free tool. You can download this on Mac. You can download it on Windows. You can pull it up on your Android or iOS on your iPhone. And though on your mobile devices, you don't have the same complete functionality as you have on a desktop uh, process, you can still do an awful lot. And what's cool about the... Uh, mobile device options is it can tie to the compass on your phone so basically you can use it hey what's that bright object that I see in the sky pull your phone out turn up Stellarium access the mobile version and basically like center that bright object with your phone and it'll tell you what that object is it'll show up with a little tooltip that says hey this is uh, Castrum Pollux or this is uh, the double cluster or this is Vega it'll tell you what it is which is pretty cool uh, and that's not just from a hey I don't know anything about this guy I want to know what that bright object is this is I, I do a lot I'm, I'm no expert by any means I do a lot of looking at things in the sky but when I set up my telescope in an unfamiliar area uh, it's instrumental in saying hey I can point that object out and now I can use that star as a point of reference to get my mount aligned so pulling up planetarium software whether it's Stellarium which is what I've talked about here um, uh, or any other number of options that are available they're great like they help build that knowledge base and I'm not ashamed to admit that I've been at outreach events where someone asks a question about a given bright object in the sky and I'm supposedly the expert well no I pull out my phone <laughs> and I find that object and click 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 the phone tells me lots of information distance from earth um, when it was discovered who discovered all that stuff that's all stuff that yeah some people I've known people like Joe Schuster my mentor just knows all that information um, I don't but I still want to be able to help inspire people asking questions about the sky and answer them 
whether it's with Stellar or, or any other app. Um, so I think it's probably all I'm going to talk about here. I just think that it's pretty cool that this kind of free software exists. I can customize it to not just things that I find interesting, but things that will help me with my planning process in terms of capturing images in the sky. Um, and I think this is going to be a game changer now that I've got everything set up. I think it'll be pretty cool. So uh, I guess it's probably where I'll end the cast. Thanks for tuning in if you did. And uh, if you have any questions, either send them on YouTube or Facebook. I'm casting simultaneously. And this is also a test for when I want to live stream the Mercury Transit. So talking about the Mercury Transit before I end this, it's not looking good weather-wise for where I am. Um, it's looking like we're probably going to have some clouds, not just clouds, but we have a snowstorm that's coming in Sunday night through Monday morning. The transit for where I am is going to be visible from 7.15 or 7.14, as we saw in the software, all the way through to about 11 a.m. Um, right now, the weather is showing that we're going to have clouds and snowstorms throughout that entire duration. Now, in this area, the weather patterns change very frequently. So it's not a nail in the coffin that I can't cast it, but it's not looking great for me casting the entire thing, um, though I may be able to get a portion of it. Um, so I'm watching the weather very closely. It may not, it may not happen. I'm going to be very frustrated if it doesn't happen because the next Mercury transits in 2032. And uh, that's just going to be unfortunate. But hey, it is what it is. If I myself cannot cast the Mercury transit, I will probably just recast someone else's live stream. Uh, give them credit, of course, and say, hey, this is who I'm watching. But somewhere on the planet, someone's going to get to watch the Mercury Transit. Uh, if it's not me, it'll suck, but I'll still cast. So if you want to watch it, because it is, it's not a very common event. Um, it's not going to be super exciting because it's, as you saw in the software here, it's going to be a small sphere moving in front of a larger sphere. Uh, but I would hope that the weather clears up and I can cast it. But if not, I'll still find someone to where you can watch it. Because it is it is something that doesn't happen that often. Um, other than that, I don't really have anything else to report. I am planning on putting an observatory in this location. Um, I've got to figure out the logistics of it. But basically, I need an observatory with a dome to block the wind. It's super windy here. All that wind knocks the scope around. And as you can guess, if you're looking zoomed in very closely to a small location in the sky, all that wind is going to block things around, knock it around. You're not going to have a very focused image. Um, so I am looking at getting a small backyard observatory that I can take apart and take with me when I move with the army. Um, but the first order of business coming up is that Mercury transit. I'll be watching the weather very closely. And if I have to, I won't cancel the event. I'll just stream someone else's feed if I have to. So regardless, it'll be going on. I'll still be online, even if I'm casting someone else's Mercury Transit, I'll still be online to answer questions. I'm always open to answer questions. I love it when people ask questions that I don't know the answer to because it forces me to look it up online and it allows me to learn something that I didn't know since I couldn't answer the question. Uh, and I think everybody learns and grows from questions that are asked. So any question space related, I always uh, request that you present it and I can either know the answer or find the answer. Either way, we'll all learn something. And uh, thanks for tuning in. I'll try to keep it posted on my astrophotography stuff. And again, thanks for sticking around for this live cast. Have a good night.